Hello. Um, uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, uh, I, I'm going to talk uh, just very briefly for about a few things that we did last year, uh, which I think um, are useful to share on on the on the proviso that we're all friends here. And as I explain the things we got wrong, um, and the things sometimes we got right, that uh, we all assume good faith. I think that's uh... so. We um, so this this we're ba we're based in Holbeck in South Leeds, and I run. Uh, I'm part of a team that runs a theatre company that runs the oldest working men's club in Britain. Uh, called the Holbeck and and it's pretty much not quite but it's the only it's one of the only sort of public spaces for the whole um internal spaces for the whole community so we host a lot of different things and we are a lot of different things to a lot of people and when we um when we uh stopped closed for covid lockdown one a year and a bit ago um we were asked by the council to become the ward lead for social care referrals so it meant that we never actually closed but i think that's really important to know that, that a lot of what we did in terms of um, performance and events was from a from from the point of view of, of, of everyone was already at work because we were basically running a food bank for seven and a half thousand um, households so that's what we've been doing for the last year um, and as part of that we did that for a few months and it's fine and we'd like walk dogs and got and all that sort of stuff um, but as part of of um, that we delivered um, 85 hot meals to children um every lunchtime the same families every lunchtime and what we discovered is we they were from mecca bingo so they were something and chips every day and if you ever want to genuinely feel heroic <laughs> give out 85 portions of something and chips in holbeck because i'm um, literally they'll go the chip man's coming the chip man's coming and uh and then you arrive and you're like wow everyone's really pleased to see me it's just pretty good anyway so we went to see them every every day and what we discovered that we did this for months and that really hot summer, I don't know whether you remember, where we, we, we started to feel like we might be on the edge of a riot, which actually it turned out we were on the edge of many riots, but it really felt like that Hobbit. And as we were, um, as we were doing that, we, um, we started to notice that the kids were going wild. And I don't mean this in any, I mean, again, assume good faith, but they were, it was starting to get really, it was starting to get really wild. And the parents were beaten. I mean, they were just knackered. I was knackered, but they were knackered. And, and obviously the great privilege of going to the same houses every single day at the same time to drop off some food is you get a two minute chat and you get a two minute chat every day over a number of months. And we, we said, this is getting over like we, we're really struggling to cope. And we're talking about communities that have a huge, huge digital um, poverty. Um, so they weren't able to access a lot of the really exciting things that were happening last year. And, and, and generally speaking, really tiny houses and, and quite big families and an awful lot of poverty and a huge amount of food poverty, which is what we were doing there in the first place. So we started to get um, talking to the parents and said, what can we do to help? And they said, anything, like at this point, anything. So we're a theatre company and we said, well, we'll put on a show. Um, so we put on a show, uh, which felt pretty, it didn't feel, it was fine. Uh, we just, we, we got a resident theatre company that's a specialist in making children's theatre and We've got loads of resource. We're a theatre company. We're very lucky. And then about six hours, and we told everybody, we told everybody that we were going to do it. This isn't like a secret rave in a, in a field outside Glasgow and we're all going to get high and run away when the police arrive. We said, this is what we're going to do. And everyone was pretty cool. And then the Secretary of Culture, <laughs> about six hours before we went up, went on the telly and said, in two weeks' time, outdoor performance will be allowed. And I thought to myself, in two weeks time he says and that does imply that in this moment now outdoor performance is not really allowed and it was the first uh, we'd actually come of it because they made they they <laughs> thanks in large part to us individually they made sure that loophole was covered in the future they were like because they hadn't actually specifically said you weren't allowed to do outdoor shows they said a lot of stuff around it but crucially uh, we felt we'd found a loophole Anyway, we went ahead. Uh, it was reasonably, it was very successful as in the kids came. It was the beginning. We did another 11 shows that summer. Uh, we would go on to do performances right up until the 23rd of December. Uh, thankfully, all the other ones were not in any real sense illegal. That first one was really, let's be honest, in a very real sense, not allowed. The interesting thing about this, I'll show you how we did it in a second and we can get into the nuts and bolts later if that's helpful. But the interesting thing about this is we told everyone, and I mean literally all the way to the very top of the council I was talking about this year before, and the day before, and nobody blinked. They all made it really clear that if it went wrong, it was on me. 
but um, which is fine because that's I have no problem with that at all. But but nobody blinked. Um, there were some people who were furious. None of them were the people who are in charge. None of them were health and safety. None of them were lead city council, licensing, police, or any of the other people that you would expect to be moderately pissed off if someone just goes willy nilly about the place performing. And I would say that, that, that a number of things happened there, one of which is we have a clear imperative and it's a moral imperative. We had a moral imperative and I would still say we do. And all the things we had done for the council and the food bank and everything else we've done, which has cost us tens of thousands of pounds, are driven by a moral imperative. And that was no different from this show. The second thing is we didn't take any money. None of the shows we did, we took any money. We're, and I get that some of you are looking at me going, what? He looks like a communist. We are unbelievably privileged. We get well funded by the Arts Council because we have a reputation nationally for theatre makers, it's got nothing to do with Holbeck. And we use that money to do fun things in Holbeck and don't bother charging anyone for it. Which, once you've removed that profit uh, imperative, you can put in all sorts of things to make it safe and keep all the, all the licensed people off your back. But and, and I get that that's a privilege and I'm looking around at some of you I know and some of you are like, yeah, you're in the same boat as us. But, you know, also not. Some of you aren't. Um, and but I think that alongside that kind of moral clarity, there was also a real, a really in-depth, deep, meaningful understanding of the rules, what we were doing in proximity to the rules, some some pretty swanky and pretty arguing with the rules a little bit and 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 then risk and who held that risk and what could go wrong and when it went wrong who would it go wrong to and what what is what is the worst case of what's the worst course of action and what do you do when that happens and i think that there was a moment when oh just because it's bloody secretary of culture we were like right there is a real and present danger that they that the authorities turn up but we are not going to cancel this we've got a bunch of kids coming this is not we're doing this but we did have a real clear sense of what we would do at each step. And what that does, because we're in a position where we take the responsibility, I don't have a board, I can lose my license, I can be prosecuted like anybody else has, but I can't really be told off. That means the responsibility and the danger is mine. And so I take that. But what it means is that I have to have, and I know that all of you guys, because your event, you all have this, but I have to have a really in-depth knowledge of what was and isn't illegal. Now, you don't need a license to do a live broadcast of a television or a radio show. That's a fact. At the time, it was allowed to have a television or broad, live television broadcast because the old Vic in London, which is a very swanky theatre, was doing exactly the same thing. We have a headphone system where the actors wear radio mics and the audience wear headphones. And we decide that that could be clarified as a radio station. And it could because I have to license it as a radio station. So if I put a bunch of performers on one end of the car park on a, a lorry and put some radio mics on them and I put a bunch of... Now, can I do this? But a bunch of kids in these bad boys. Oh, I love that no one can do this. I can't do this without narrating myself. And now I'm pressing a button and now you'll see. Right, do you see that's a, that's a drone shot. Don't even get to me on licensing drones. But that's a drone shot of, of what we had. So these are all tents. So that all the kids are in there wearing headphones. All the performers are here on this lorry. And so we were arguing that actually that is a broadcast. That is, and look at that lads that looks like a broad james gray's going yeah that looks like a broadcast on me friend so that's a broadcast which um you know you don't necessarily want to put that to test in a court of law but it was enough to keep everybody chill my point isn't that we should all break the rules it really isn't but my point is that is that um like all rules there has to be a moral imperative to this there just has to be i just i, I by coincidence i did my licensing uh, exam yesterday um and there are all sorts of preposterous uh things you can sell drinks i know one year after i yeah no i know you can only imagine how happy my producer was at that uh you can you can sell drinks in a vehicle as long as the vehicle is temporarily or permanently parked what is that about these are daft these are daft systems that that uh, that, uh, that, that are in place but they're in place as as scaffolding and as ladders and certainly a really in-depth um i've been attacked by a dog <laughs> uh, a really in-depth knowledge of that was really helpful not because in reality if i was up in front of a magistrate and i explained that radio thing that they were going to behave like james gray and be like do you know what <laughs> no case to answer uh, but because actually that gave me enough um confidence to go well actually the risk is ours with with risk you always have to do one thing you have to own it 
you have to mitigate it or you or, or, or you have to um, pass it on to someone else and there isn't anyone else at the whole bit we can pass it on to us so we either own it or we mitigate it or we we avoid the thing we're doing um Finally, and, and I've gone on too long, so I'll quickly shut up, Emma, but the, the last one is we were approached by Elite City Council and said, Holbeck Moor is a really brilliant piece of grass just next to the club. And they said, we want more people to use Holbeck Moor. It's a really big part of a strategy, a brilliant strategy across Elite City Council. Can you come on? Can you can you help us do this? So we came up with this really complicated system. Uh, well, actually, a really simple system that, that, that members of the public could just go and book the, the, the moor and we would deal with the bookings and we would hold the risk and we would hold the event plan and we would hold the insurance and, and administratively it would be ours. And there was a little part of me that was like, I feel like I'm doing the city council's job here for us, but it's also in our, our moral imperative is we have to get the health outcomes of our neighbourhood up. Otherwise, I've been feeding them white bread for the last year for absolutely no bloody point. So it, it fitted with our ambition. So we said, we'll do this. And we prepared all this work and got the insurance and everything else. And then another department of the council who were lovely people and just doing their job came along and went this is a ridiculous fucking idea stop it immediately and then there was like blue on blue fighting council people fighting council people it was like like the age of ultron and i didn't know who was spider-man and who wasn't anyway it all gets to the end and we end up with one of those you know where you have a fight and then someone really sensible in council says, says like can we just all sit down and talk to each other like grown-ups so we sit down and talk to each other like grown-ups and the people who are in charge of booking out the parks were like the number of things you don't need permission for to do in a park is extraordinary and I was like, like what? Because I was still angry because I just spent all this time getting fucking insurance for a field. And they started listing it. And I was like, God, that's loads. And they were like, you want to do a sports day? It's got a generator? No, you don't need a license. And I was like, ah. Oh. And so, I and, and but obviously the form you get from the council is like, where is your events license? And do you have an event plan? And there will be a fireman who'll come and stick a hose in your ear if you don't do it properly. And actually all of that's fine, but it's bullshit. It, not that it's not necessary. It's just perfectly designed to put muggles off. And actually, as a bunch of non-muggles, we're like, okay, well, we know that stuff. Like, here's my insurance. Stop shouting at me, you weirdo. Here is it. Listen, I've seen the fun fair they put on that field. Anything I do is not going to be as dangerous as a fucking fun fair. Do you know what I mean? So I feel <laughs> wild now, aren't I? Because I haven't had a fucking pudding. So, um, yeah, and I've got it. Um, I'm finishing, I promise. But uh, the thing that became really apparent about all of this is, is that the gatekeepers that were there were not the gatekeepers we thought, which isn't to let the council off the hook for putting fun tax and everything and generally sometimes being a pain in my bum. But actually, they were like, please do stuff. Um, and, and two weeks later, we announced we were going to do a football club and take over a bit of the field. And everyone in the council was over the moon. And so I think the thing that both those stories I would tell is that, that uh, yes, you can definitely borrow my kit, whoever's just to say, um, is that, those lines are there to be pushed, not aggressively, they're just there to be pushed. No one from the council blinked when we put those shows on. The only people who blinked were the people from the kind of large arts organisations who were desperately terrified that, that we were going to drag fucking dishonour upon the name of the arts in, in the city, which, I, you know, quite frankly, there are other people doing a much better job of dragging dishonour onto that name than I am. But um, they're there to be pushed because that's how our job, I think. Like, I want to do this. It's a public space. You, you are public servants. Let's crack on with this. And I have found with the odd occasion that most people are desperate to help, even if you're not necessarily with a straight face explaining that the play you're definitely putting on a car park is in actual fact a radio station that has been licensed as a radio station and therefore cannot be prosecuted under COVID laws. I've got to stop. I've, sort of run out. I've, I've spent spoke too long, but I look forward to chatting to you all. Is, was that what you wanted, Emma? I sort of threw in some flair. I did some shouting. I did a bit of showbiz shit, swearing at the end. I feel like I'm... you're not going. You've got You're-huh. to stay here to the bitter end. <laughs> I can't put mute on. People, people are going to have questions for you, Alan. So, um, a bit of swearing. I, I, um, do you want me to edit this video after, or just no, leave it as is? I swear, otherwise they ask me to give them their money back. Excellent. Well, I think there were some pretty um, impressive kind of call to arms there as well, with moral imperatives, with, you know, people, do, why are we doing all of this as well? I mean, sometimes you forget, actually, you lose sight of why do we all do this? And it ultimately is so that people have bloody great times, I think, if you want to boil it down to anything. And the getting there is quite labyrinthian sometimes. Not everybody, sadly, is blessed with um, the kind of confidence and experience let's say that you have acquired over your you know 20 billion years of doing stuff Alan <laughs> you 
He's actually 95, he just drinks something different to the rest of us. So, you know, um, whilst we've got him here, obviously, I think we can probably soak his brain a little bit, but I think perhaps um, there's many, there are other Allens out there, and there might be some amongst us, in fact. So that's what I'm hoping, that we can actually start, to, I mean, uh, there may be this existing already, and if it is, brilliant, but I think um, the more we can kind of go, we don't all know the answers, um, COVID, does require ingenuity. It does require, it's constantly shifting sand under our feet. Um, you know, so going from a kind of, it's not performance, it's a radio show is bloody brilliant, isn't it? So I imagine our collective wit is off the scale here. So, you know, give us some rules and we'll work with them. But if they keep changing every two minutes, that's quite difficult to deal with. Um, and again, none of us want to do anything that um, leads to harm to anybody. So, we are in new terrain. I've seen from Natalie's um, comments that she's got a festival in June and she says she's bricking it, but she's very modest as well because Natalie pulls off a fucking brilliant show anywhere she goes. So um, just for context, Playful Anywhere have been, we've got shipping containers, which we call play boxes. And we have been luckily commissioned to do something on Brigitte in Leeds, which is in the city center and the main sort of um, busiest pre-COVID times, um, bustling kind of commercial environment, which we love to go and create all sorts of cardboard, chalk, messy capers, um, and really give people a chance to sort of dwell and hang out and play in the middle of their city centre, um, on their way somewhere quite often thinking they're going to go shopping and then five hours later they just can't drag their kids away and they're, they're still there. And our brief um, is kind of what stimulated this sort of gathering really because whilst um, my head's kind of been a bit treacly not delivering stuff for last year I was like oh my god what are these new rules that we have to navigate on a very busy shopping um, road and you know we've got these new rules this roadmap and yeah so I, I don't want to kill anybody I don't want to end up sued and those are my sort of main have fun don't kill anybody usually my motto so I'm sure that I won't be alone in this um, looking forward to the next few months, people are starting to come out of their shells. The, you know, the phone's ringing, it's all brilliant, but actually how do we um, navigate it in such a way that, you know, we don't kill ourselves or anybody else? That is really my question generally. <laughs> so um, we can, at this point, have a much more informal discussion. Um, I've, I'm not really keen on putting us into breakout rooms because I think there's not too big a group here. So if we can just kind of um, think about what is it that you're up to, what concerns have you got, and can the, can we sort of share that with a group? And let's say we've got, what time are we on now? Eight o'clock. So we're here till, what time? What, what time is this event finishing? In another hour, is it? It finishes at some time anyway. So we'll, we'll, have, we'll have about a 20 minutes discussion or more if it looks like it's useful and then we'll get on to the how do we start to do something that's useful in terms of a wiki or whatever the way of sharing information like um you know ideas about risk assessments plans insurances whatever comes to mind really that becomes a practical element to this as well as our philosophy as well so i'm gonna um open the floor up to anybody who wants to start the conversation going and it can be who are you how's your you know your COVID been and what are you looking forward to what support might you need from a group like this feel free to unmute yourself first person to pipe up goes um right okay um uh yeah um i'm just curious about i suppose it's how we deal with the outdoorness because I'm used to doing stuff that's indoors. So um, both the arts organisations I work with, the children's puppetry company and uh, sort of more general arts crafts organisation, I suppose we might describe ourselves as, um, we're both interested in doing workshops, but we do workshops, you know, either indoors with lots of people at close proximity and it's like, how can we handle this potentially outdoors? or um, the other organisation we've been basically doing indoor in front of your computer on your own workshops and can we do something like that 
that's more social than the lockdown workshops as things open up and people hopefully get together? So um, I can jump in here um, a little bit. We, as part of our festival, we've been looking at the same kind of thing. And um, one of the things that we've been talking about is um, like grab bags of materials so that people can then take them away, but in the same kind of socially distanced vicinity, have all the materials that they need. We're particularly doing something in a park. So we can then kind of allow people to get a social distance, do their activities, and they still be kind of, you know, within sight line of, of people that we're working with. Um, just as a, a suggestion, I did just make up a thousand grab bags and it nearly killed me, however. So maybe not a thousand. We were thinking of that and we're thinking of much lower numbers than a thousand. That's Can I say something, Emma? Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. Go for it. Yes, yes. I was just thinking about like Leeds dads did, um, they did their dad's tastic online this year and they did something similar, Natalie. They sent out a lot of the materials in advance. So they were doing like record box and things. So they sent out a vinyl thing to all the participants and things like that. And we've done some stuff, Child Friend Elite have done stuff with the Scouts. They, they did a festive fun box and they did, um, they got a really nice wooden box, filled it with all different crafts. Um, and they produced like a little A5 booklet and then the instructions were in the booklet written down, but then they also did like online sessions that were live, but also they were recorded and then shared afterwards. So that like a lot of our foster families and kinship families could join the regular scouts and sort of take part. And that was really successful. And like our families really appreciated that. It's not the same as gathering together. It's that sort of, you know, and they understand that people want to be back together and doing stuff face to face and it's not the same but it depends I suppose it depends on what the activity is and how safe it is to go ahead and do it but that is another option like Natalie said. Um, just to big up Armley for a little bit one of the things that we've all been doing over in Armley is having that blended approach um, a bit like hold back when in a situation where a lot of people don't have access to digital but then at the same time people often are uncomfortable accessing physical spaces um, so we've had to make sure that all of our projects are taking that double fold approach that we're allowing people to access outdoor spaces but there's always digital content behind it to back it up afterwards um, we were allowed after a lot of begging by uh, parks and countryside to put up a sign in Armley Park after being told categorically no signage is allowed in any of these parks um, that had a QR code on it that people could scan and would take them through to a daily discovery and through Lee's, Inf uh, Lee's Inspired funding we've now created a permanent digital archive about Armley um, with a new sign erected a more permanent sign again with the QR code so whether you're coming to it digitally or discovering it through the park, there's that twofold access. Um, another project that's just taken place has been the Bunting Festival by another CIC in Armley called We Belong Here. They put together craft activity packs, which they distributed uh, through... Uh, local shops and centres. People were picking up their groceries from their corner shops in a little bunting bag. Uh, go home, make the bunting, design it. They've collected them, piece them together. And then just today, they've used a couple of different community groups to go and tie it up to lamp posts and uh, streets. So again, you've got that double fold, the digital engagement, getting people to request, acti request activity packs, doing it at home, but then coming together and having that street gallery element where people are allowed to walk about. Um, that's something that we're about to do with our next project, which will be um, putting work up in people's windows across West Leeds and trying to turn lots of streets in West Leeds into a, uh, a gallery space. And again, just that blended approach has been really successful to us constantly backing up whatever we're doing digitally, with something physically and the other way around as well. Um, yeah, that's that's been really useful to us.
Thanks, James. I think that Parks has come up a couple of times. Well, Alan's mentioned it, Natalie's mentioned it, and you have. So maybe um, it would be useful because I think it is, it's kind of hard, it's the hard yards of doing something in a park, wherever you are in the country, um, to navigate, like Alan was saying, you know, what is expected if you want to do something. So if you have had sort of successes, for example, you know, being able to make the case for signage, what sort of things did you do in order to, to you know, was it a pure war of attrition <laughs> or was there some way you navigated the rules? What sort of ways did you go about doing that? Being a bit cheeky and bypassing the council in certain ways. Um, we're lucky here in Armley that part of the site is owned by Wade's Charity or Trust. Um, so we have a wage ranger on site here that run a lot of group activities like gardening projects, um, environmental activities, that kind of stuff. So because the site's got that duality, we were lucky enough to befriend the ranger who has just moved on, uh, who was very instrumental in getting us the contacts that we needed within parks and countryside and backing up our case. I feel that if we had gone straight to parks and countryside, the likely answer would have been possibly no. The other thing that they were very honest about with us as well, that was because of COVID, they had a lot more time on their hands, so were much more willing to actually process the application for us to put signage in. Alan, you've got your hand up. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you, James. Sorry, I was just okay, queuing up yeah. behind you. Um, I, just to say, um, we did a project last year um, on the lamppost. So we we sent a letter to every um, house in Holbeck and and said, uh, you're all locked up. You're still brilliant. You're great artists. If you make a piece of art, we'll come and take a picture of it. And hundreds of people did. And then we took a picture of it and we printed it on large uh, weatherproof boards. And then we put them up on the lamppost so that when people went for their Boris Bimble, they could see the art made by all the neighbours. It was hundreds of pieces. It was great. And the council paid for it because the council are brilliant. And then uh, the Yorkshire Post and all the other people and BBC Radio Leeds and all those people got in touch. And then the telly got in touch and they did a little piece about how great that was because they were doing all those pictures, the things about COVID at the time. And then my phone rang and I was in the bath and it was, and I, I shit you not, this is a real life person. It was the principal lamppost engineer for Leeds City Council. And he's a <laughs> lovely man, but he was absolutely furious because he'd been watching Look North. And he said, you've put hundreds of boards up all over the lamppost. And I was like, yes, I have. And he was like, they're coming down tomorrow morning. And he did his whole thing. And I'm not, uh, he's, I'm sure he, no, he's a lovely man. And he was just doing his job and he said, they're coming down tomorrow morning and you can't do this. And, and so I was like, cool. Now I had a, I had a, I had two, a pair of kings in my hand because I knew what I knew. And I know that the council had paid for it. So they weren't coming down tomorrow because the council had paid for it. And the, and the ward council had given us money and Lee City council had given us, the arts department had given me money. And it wasn't his fault. He just ran onto the punch and he was like, you're taking them down. And I'm like, Oh man, we're gonna come on! I got all this art, and we tried to negotiate. And what before I then finally said, "Look, man, we, we, they aren't coming down because you paid for them." Is he didn't have the authority to say I could do that? That's what it really comes down to. He was he was doing his job. He was protecting the lamppost. He didn't have authority to let some lunatic run around. There isn't a form for that. So actually, I was much better off asking for forgiveness. And, and really what actually he really cared about, and this is worth knowing, is he didn't want someone to lean a ladder against the lamppost. That's it, because then they break. He just wanted someone to put an A-frame next to the lamp. And I was like, that's what we do, bruv. I'll send you the working method statement. And he was happy. But if I'd rung him, and I, this, is, this goes to your point, James, they do, he doesn't have the authority to say yes. So actually I didn't you know it wasn't a lie I, I didn't hide anything I told the council what we we're going to do Leeds inspired pay for it the ward councils threw a load of money in as well everyone was really happy because what that guy really wants is he doesn't want anyone to break his lamppost he's not a bad man he just doesn't want anyone to break his lamppost so he just needs some cover and he needed someone who said I've used an A-frame um, and and I look at you know, bless you, some, of this, some people on this call are actually in positions of authority as opposed to just idiots that run pubs in South Leeds, but asking for forgiveness rather than permission, unless it's dangerous, that's a different thing. We can talk about that. And it turned out happy. Then we did another lamppost project and I, and I pinged him an email and he said, no, until he remembered I was the guy who'd already said yes to. And then he said, yes, and I was like, there it is, bruv, there it is. He's, 
I've never met anybody who works for any of these people that's a bad person. Honestly, I've never have, but they don't have the authority to say yes. So you have to find ways for it to, to make, to completely remove the risk from them and then make it impossible for them to say. And it really helps if the council's already paid for it. That is just, it's just a really helpful thing. I think sometimes it can work in reverse as well, that sometimes we have to be a little bit forgiving of councils. Um, we had a situation in Armley where the park, uh, the playground in the park has been up for redesign for ages and obviously was put on halt for COVID, but all the plans were in place, the land was marked out and the forestry department then dedicated the land that the park was meant to be going, the playground was meant to be going on towards tree planting and it kicked up a massive storm on Facebook of community groups being very upset that all of a sudden all of these paint lines were put down in the park and men with vans were turning up to plant trees and been allocated for almost 12 months towards a brand new playground going in. And, you know, you can get angry, but at the end of the day, sometimes when you're dealing with a large council organisation, it can actually be quite difficult for the left hand to talk to the right hand. And in fairness to them, they've since come back and they have changed their plans for the forestry and they're going to wait for the playground to go in, you know, so it's it's that give and take really ask ask forgiveness, but be willing to forgive without making it a sort of Quaker meeting. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even think it's just a council. I've just moved the bottle bank 20 metres in my pub from one side of the building to the other. And I currently have two campaigns on Facebook, one congratulating me for moving it and the other one insisting that I immediately chop my own head off and get out of town because I'm a scumbag. And and I mean, I can't work out the difference to anyone, but it, it people are angry. People have been stuck at home for a year. It's all right for them to blow off some steam. That's what our, our job is to find ways for them to blow it off otherwise isn't it like, i'm sorry i just yeah I, I totally agree and we've been working very closely in uh armley with local councillors and the bringing together the community group trying our hardest to change the conversation from all the things that are wrong with the area to what we can do to try and improve it and make those changes you know you can talk into your blue in your face about crime poverty littering but at some point you have to be able to get up and do something. And I think that there's that, you talked about moral imperative. I feel very strongly that one of the moral imperatives creative people have in leads at the moment within our networks is to really nurture those conversations and to help people who have been stuck in their homes to feel connected, to not feel isolated and to feel empowered to pick up litter for a tenant to do something to their garden and not worry that the landlord's going to take the deposit away from them, you know, to, to really make some impactful changes. Um, that, that's kind of our big drive for the year ahead. I think this is, I mean, this is so helpful from that sort of doorstep level, sort of unit of change through to something you can do in your park, on your street. You know, I, I guess, um, you know, riding through that storm of, you're going to annoy somebody somewhere right but the more you know what your you know your plan is or your navigating of what the rules and regulations are like alan's sort of mentioned as well is the well, power you have to your elbow and i think some of the things where you know working method statement for example and pre preempting some of that so that you talked about is two kings in the hand which i really like i'll be using stealing that expression once i get some kings in my hands or aces or whatever um is totally that thing of like collaborative collaborative work with bigger organizations can be really hard because you know not everybody talks to each other the left and their right hand don't when their heads down and stressed don't always have the chance to talk to each other and you know quite a lot of big organizations have quite siloed sort of mental you know work that they're getting on with so not everybody can know everything um, but I think the types of things that could help um, more sort of civic activism would be, well, you know, this is what you do with an engineer who comes to you worried about their lampposts. I don't know, that might exist in a nice little kind of manual somewhere, but I haven't found it yet, partly because I haven't asked that question on Twitter. <laughs> so, you know, if that's the kind of thing we can start to go, look, you can do lamppost art. And this is the, you know, these are the kings in your hand you need, roughly. And definitely the whole forgiveness bit is really key to this, because we'd never permission ourselves to do anything if we went to all the right people and got all the, it would take like five years, I think. 
So do something delightful, which means that nobody wants those posters to be taken down because you've involved them all, okay? So you can be really quite savvy about it, can't you? Which is the more people you involve in showing and reflecting back to them how wonderful they are and their community is and can be, the harder it is for people to come along and cut it down, although it does happen. So um, I really appreciate that sort of like moment of looking at moral imperative and how we take a bit more ownership over our civic spaces so that it becomes more commonplace and cultural, a cultural norm. So has anybody else got any questions that they would, they've got or that they would like to share an experience, something that they've kind of navigated the system with that has actually worked out well for them despite the odds or anybody want to contribute, put your hands up or say something in the chat so that um, it, if you're sorry. feeling shy. Hi Liam. Hi, hi uh, um, thanks Emma. I just got a quick, I mean I'm very new to this whole kind of dealing with councils and talking to them about permissions or building relationships. <laughs> Um, and um, Zoe's with me on the call here and we're looking to obviously, we're, we're from Southampton, we're looking to a project which is going to be like a four year thing, hopefully. Uh, in my mind, I'm just curious about how when local council elections come up and the possibility of council is changing, how that can impact on such a, such a, a big project that we've got in mind. So I know that, for example, in our city, it's probably on a, on a bit of a, a um, seesaw at the moment as to whether it's going to stay as a red seat or turn to a blue seat and I'm, I'm curious as to how those relationships then have to be maybe reinvented or how they have to be adapted in order to to meet those demands because I know that not obviously everyone in the council is affiliated but it's just I'm just curious as to how that impacts on on that kind of community work if anyone's got any experience I don't know I would say that um, it, the the council staff are the, are the are the people who make everything happen, and the councillors are the ones that can add uh, like the crowbars, if that makes sense. So my ward, I'm really lucky. I've got three great ward councillors, and they and we have the same um, we have the same ambition. Broadly speaking, I mean they they disagree with me about everything, but they're ward councillors. That's what they're for. That's um, but they but they want me to go in the direction they want me to go in. So I bumble on, and when I when I reach a reach a, a place in the system that I can't move on anymore like with this small thing uh, with this field I get in touch with the wood councillors and say we wanted x to happen I was achieving x through this way I've re reached a, a, a roadblock can you do that thing you do and the thing I found to be and actually I, I, we've got a ward councillor on the call so um, uh, maybe we should talk about this afterwards if this is but then my perception is that they want to kind of keep their powder dry until they're really needed and so I know when my, um, our councillor's called Councillor Angela Gabriel. She's literally the angel Gabriel. It's ridiculous. It's brilliant. And she's wonderful and ferocious. And when she comes piling in over the top, she like comes piling in over the top. So I, it's like a nuclear bomb. You kind of only want to use it once in a while. Um, whereas the staff are actually the people that keep everything going. So unless you get, uh, in my experience, and this happened in Hull uh, when we had a, a Liberal Democrat who hated money being spent on culture and it was about to become the UK city of culture and have millions of pounds spent on it and he was our guy for our little ward and that was a real pain in the ass but broadly speaking unless you have someone who's against culture it doesn't it's the staff you want the, the, the civil servants that, that you really want a good relationship with and then I have the ward councillors as like big red buttons when I'm like I'm stuck I need unsticking hit it and then they either do or sometimes they just go no you've you've, you've made this mess yourself <laughs> you fool you plow on is that I don't know I don't know yeah, it you kind know, of but is that fair? I mean, I'll out myself. I'm I'm Lou. Um, I'm an Armley resident and one of the Armley ward councillors. Um, but I probably approach things a bit differently. Um, I've only been a ward councillor for nearly two years now, and I came to it from a, a community activist kind of background. So I tend to be the person who's kind of introducing the new <laughs> artists and the new events into the system. Um, and connecting people that way so I, I guess I, you know I approach things differently but I totally agree that um, I mean f for me um, having really good contacts with the officers in, in different departments is, is crucial you know I made that one of my first goals really to get to know people um, in, in every 
department really, whether it's housing, whether it's um, the environmental side, because they're the people that my community are dealing with. So I want to know them really well. So, and that helps because a lot of the time um, community projects can come from all those different angles, from housing, there's different little pots of funding, um, from at the environmental side, there's pots of funding. So for me, having that really broad base of knowing officers from each department is really, really important. And I think that does help, help us, hopefully helps us get, you know, some of the more grassroots organisations who might not normally get the recognition for things like grants and things like input from the council, you know, um, a bit more um, on the table or on the books or on the I don't know whatever the saying is you know out there <laughs> basically and that's what I liked I really love to see that so yeah and Liam to your your question I think um Lou is probably I would say not all ward members are as wonderful as Lou <laughs> I used to live in Armley so I've got a good direct experience and I think um there it's looking for the people like you Lou in your own um in your own neck of the woods really because they, they are they are there and not everybody will be as sort of insightful gentle listening encouraging um you know and that's it's not always easy to find out but i think you can kind of pick out the people who seem genuinely interested in hearing what you've got going on and what you want to achieve and work with those people no matter what political party they are I think that's really key, actually, because I think we get mired in party politics. But actually, when you start to work with people in a community and they, you're doing something with them, it kind of shouldn't really matter what um, you know, political party or local ward members represent, because ultimately the argument you're going to make to them is this is good for the community and something that they want. Um, that's easier said than done. And I can tell you that that doesn't always appeal to certain types of personalities who think it's only their job to be there for the community. Um, so I think you can kiss a few frogs along the way as well. And just sometimes to, you've just um, got, yeah. <laughs> to, just to jump in with a bit of a horror story, not to put Liam off, um, but just to kind of be aware that things can go wrong. Where I come from in rural North Yorkshire, we had a big effort to try and save our local high street uh, through travel and tourism and make use of the various museums and trust properties around. Um, and we had a mayor who was very forward thinking and worked alongside the councils to really have a big push with arts engagement and to bring about this conversation. And then the mayor changed and the new mayor came in and their focus was on reinstating Ripon's Railway. And they uh, diverted a lot of public money to putting together proposals think if I remember rightly and don't quote me it was in the region of £30,000 and the end of that was was that the railway wasn't a viable solution wasn't going to happen they left other mayors have since come in but when you're dealing with smaller councils you know bigger city councils is different but when you're dealing with smaller councils you can get people that do come in with very clear ideas of what they want to achieve in their time and it can put other things in halt. Um, I doubt as if that would happen in a in a larger council because as Alan said um, there's a huge infrastructure behind them and uh, you know councillors can come and go but a lot of the infrastructure stays the same but at a smaller level there can be some real detrimental effects that happen so just be prepared have a backup plan Can, can I just jump in there, Matt, do you mind? Just to say, hi, Liam. Um, we've got several council officers on the call, actually, who probably would all tell you that, that although we work in political organisations, it really doesn't matter if you've got a good idea. If you can convince someone that what you're doing is right, I think it goes across all parties. And also the other thing that Alan... Um, Alan, Alan has had events on on my front lawn. I say mine, <laughs> the council's front lawn on Temple Newsom. Um You have. <laughs> I have. I have. You have. You have. Uh, and most of the um, 
council parks bylaws and regulations of hosting events and things that happened it probably wasn't I wouldn't say scrutinized but but Alan's been successful in his events so success does breed success which makes you more confident that what they're going to do is correct and that they're not going to burn you know uh, the house down and we're not going to lose our, our heritage just because they've had a couple of bonfires on the lawn which ordinarily we wouldn't allow but it's it's that success that breeds success as well that's what i would say and also the support i've had from people in the parks who have who have guided us through that i think that's also that's also uh, very true to say is that without them we may well have not had those uh, initial success that bred that com uh, confidence it's, it's it's a team sport so i think what we're gleaning really is it's about relationship building you know so that obviously um the rules are there to keep everybody safe and sometimes they might feel a little um bureaucratic or you know erring on the side of caution but the, the real challenge I think we all have is working out how, how do we communicate what our little twinkle in the eye of an idea might be and how do we bring people on with us and if we haven't got as much experience let's say and built up the um, you know let's look at Slumgo for example if they, they've set the you know trailblazers that they are you know what can we learn from people that have gone before us and how can we lend our support to people who are just starting out on this journey. And I think I don't ever feel like I really know what I'm doing, hence why I thought we were starting at eight rather than 7.30 today. <laughs> and my face still hasn't calmed down. Um, but that doesn't mean to say I'm not prepared to try. And I think my, you know, 15 years of doing this now, I probably do have a little bit of wisdom, but I don't always feel like that. So if someone comes to me, I'll go, oh no, don't speak to me. You know, of course that's bollocks really. I've done lots of things and I probably know a little tiny bit more than people who are just starting out. So what I really hope for this kind of community really is to sort of go, well, Alan set fire to things. How did he do it? James knew how to put a sign on um, Gott's part, a part of the park. And, you know, we've got this kind of navigation that we need to get through and never more now, and then COVID, you know, so bringing us back to where we are now, we've got another half an hour where we can kind of look at what practical steps can we take um, I think already in the chat there have been things like can we share um, risk assessments and um, what else we said, you know, practical things like the method statements. I spoke to Alan before today's chat and, you know, talked about context. So maybe, Alan, could you give a bit more about context because the document is a document and it won't be the same for everybody using it. So before, so Alan, can you do a little bit about that? And then I think we could get into the what sort of things do you think we could start to share and trust each other on and what kind of way can we do that? So we'll have half an hour and obviously today isn't the end of it. So having met other people and I know some of us have talked more than others and some of you have been quiet. So feel, you know, if you don't want to actually talk out loud, that's absolutely fine. But do use the chat function to make sure that you connect with people. So you don't go away from today thinking, oh, I wish I'd said that, or I wish I'd made friends with someone, they sound really helpful. So it's a start, not the end. So Alan, do you want to talk a little bit about context um, when it comes to sharing information, hard won, learning, etc.? cetera? Yeah, I, um, one of the rules at Slung Low is everything we have, whether it be our spaces or our van or anything is, is anyone else's, because it's not ours, it was, it was spent with public money, we were paid for by the Arts Council. Um, and so, and that uh, that also follows for um, knowledge, uh, intellectual property. I, I organise um, events uh, uh, for for the army, and I promise you that the way it's done is you ring the guy that did it last time, and you say, "Can you send me all your paperwork, please?" And the first thing you do is read his paperwork, and if it went really well, you're like, "I've got some really good paperwork," um, and that's not cheating. <laughs> so I don't understand why the arts don't do that because it would save so much time. So um, one of the things is well, I'm happy to share any and all documents that we have. But the but the but the, the reason why everybody doesn't do that is, is one this weird thing about you paid someone to do it and therefore you don't want to give it away. But also another one is that you're putting yourself at risk. Like um 
an event plan is never finished because it isn't until the event's finished. I don't go back and fill it in after I've done it. I've got an event, I've got a plan. And then when the, I actually hit the road, I've had to make some changes because I don't know, the wind's going in the other direction and I desperately don't want to set fire to Linda's Temple Newsome. So um, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, but I haven't gone back and I don't, I'm not, no one's going to mark my homework. I don't go back and fill in my event plan. So any documents you get from us are, are never going to be finished. They're, ne they're not finished because we finished the show we moved on to the next one the learning came with us and i think that there's a a sense that a, a, you know people go show me your risk assessments like that's going to make any difference if the thing i'm doing is dangerous it, we will not find that danger in the risk assessment um so i think that's where the, the industry gets itself kind of all mixed up that say say amy's mad as a box of frogs and is drunk and and takes my risk assessments and, and organizes an event and it's terrible and she's like but i had alan lane's event plan i'm like it doesn't matter you're a loon you should never have been in charge um and so um that's i'm sorry amy i just picked on you because you're in my airline you look like you were one of the few people i hadn't already insulted this evening so this is going excellently well for me <laughs> i'm gonna turn up in the morning and just have all of my events this year cancelled um yeah so i uh, so that that that's, I think, why the industry, because it's about risk and it's about um, that event plan is so that um, so that me and my team can make sure that the risk is in the right place. Um, and and people get worried that because you're holding a piece of paper from someone else, they say they told me they could do it. <sighs> the context of how you want to say, for example, the example Linda used, like build a small bonfire in the middle of Temple Newsom is different as to who's going to be there. Who, I mean, the, every single detail of that event will be different if you repeat it. And it may well be that they turn around and say no, or it may be they turn around and say twice as big as that is the only way that we will accept this bonfire. Um, but that knowledge is really useful because I think, and the thing me and Emma was talking about is it buys you the time not to be panicked. And I think that's really important. We, we always have the event plan on site. If we're doing the, the shows we make tend to involve a lot of fire, a lot of water, a lot of like people on ropes and just generally things that look dangerous and people turn up it's amazing how not the authorities but like just random strangers will turn up and go that looks so unsafe and we just hand them the event plan which is about you know one of the big shows that's like 350 pages long and we hand it to them and go read that and then we'll talk because not because it just buys me 20 minutes whoever i remember the the guy that was off the off royal um offshore oil rigs turned up at my site in hull which was a site of water and really started kicking off and i just needed 20 minutes to just so I handed him and, and that's what that paperwork does it gives you some scaffolding to do the thinking it doesn't replace that thinking for you it just buys you a bit of time but the industry gets really nervous about it, or the art sector gets really nervous about it because they're worried that they somehow you taking their risk assessments gives it that's not true if you take my event plan and go and stuff something up it is not my responsibility <laughs> that's on you i've got my own problems to worry about so i would i would say if you need anything like that i'm more than happy to share it all we had a we had a, a christmas fair at christmas that that was uh, all of our local community christmas fairs brought together and then done outside and it was the most careful careful event we've ever done because it was right and everybody in the local community wanted to happen the council on site everyone was like this has got to happen but my god this is a tightrope and so there was this incredible and the, and the reason why we could do it is we didn't have a profit motive. We we had more staff. We, we had so many staff there. I can't tell you. It was insane. You would not have been able to run the Leeds City Centre, get drunk and eat hot chocolate, Christmas market like that. It would just you just couldn't. But we could. In a little backwater of Holbeck, we had forty stalls and a thousand people came through there. But they came up through there over eight hours. It's just not so that that context is really important. Important. But happy to share all documents, and I would encourage you to do that on the understanding that if I take Helen Wells' risk assessments and set fire to something, that is on me and not on Helen Wells. Um, but that is something that's not necessarily understood. Thanks, Alan. I think that's a very generous offer. And like you say, um, the profit thing is quite interesting as well, because um, I think, you know, there's if you're freelance or self-employed, you know, there is a kind of need, I think, to, can, well, number one to keep going and making work and what have you and sometimes we can become a little bit obsessive or worried about cutting our noses off despite our faces but actually I truly believe if we become more collaborative more good work it's a, it's a rising tide lifts all boats effectively so the, I think the IP of some of the things that we feel very protective over doesn't always help us um, the, the kind of ratio of staff though actually kind of worries me as somebody who puts together a budget and quite often people flinch when I'm kind of saying you know that's how many people you're going to need in a busy public space um, and I'm sure people think people want to volunteer to do that 
that work. It's like if you really want a place which you cannot predict who's going to turn up, a busy shopping centre or a park, you've got to have a lot of people on. Um, but people's budgeting and commissioning don't always consider that. So I think making the case as well might be another thing that this group could do, which is to say, these are the ratios you're going to need to look at in a time when we've got such uncertainty and especially in public spaces, which don't have lockable gates at each end and what have you. So um, I'm hoping that by having a small army of people, we can start to demand better as well in terms of how we go about commissioning things or navigating some of the, that risk. Um, Zoe's asked a question, um, and I think it's really pertinent actually, and it's about, you know, I don't know if you're all feeling this, but Zoe can explain a bit more about her question now, but we're, we're kind of rushing back into opening up, it feels. Zoe, do you want to say a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Zoe, um, I run Zoology Dance Theatre down here in Southampton. Um, and just a little bit of context, it, during COVID, we did one of the only participatory events in the city centre down here because I lost my marbles that I might not be able to bring people together for an amazing dance experience. Had a meltdown, so I created a giant grid of two by two, by two metre squared, 64 of them, took over a space. So basically the council couldn't say no because it was so COVID uh, protected. Um, that was my way through and we got the license since at 10 a.m. on the morning of the gig and everyone wrote, arrived at two. So um, yeah, that whole risk um, element uh, was, was amazing, but this community of people learned offline with us and came together for a really euphoric moment of just like, wow, what does it mean to stand together? And what I've been doing with that work is like the healing process is really important. I work in physical touch, you know, and that's like the furthest removed from sitting in a pub next to someone, um, you know, social distancing. So uh, what's happening now because of that event, I just wondered if anyone else is feeling this, is that there, there's lots of talk in the council, there's lots of talk with people about events, just June switch. That's one perspective but I've got friends who can't leave their houses yet you know and I'm interested in what's happening now we come back to risk is I'm being asked well can you switch it all back on and can you animate the the area uh, and take all the risk and bring all the people and um yeah I'm just sharing really I'm just wondering if anyone else is feeling that pressure for us to take the responsibility I feel the same. I mean, personally, I'm like excited to be considering how we get back out there and have missed working with the public. But at the same time, I do feel like this horrible rush of uh, fear of missing out type stuff going on as well. And I don't really think that we're really taking that moment to reflect on what's, you know, what's gone on in the last year. So, you know, that thing we were talking about touch and tactile and Sen you know sensory and sensual kind of experiences I it's kind of gonna be hard to predict how people are gonna are they gonna be frenzied you know what, what <laughs> how is it gonna be and how can we do this in such a way that we don't get burned and but uh, and no nobody else does as well so I think it's such an important point you're making about how we do this in such a way that um we don't end up you know again with another outburst of more covid for example um but rushing forward feels really wrong i think personally thank you for sharing that zoe thank you just be amazing to know like to keep with this sort of chat going because i think there's there's empowering on our own in silo but knowing that this is happening in other places gives someone like uh, uh, me in southampton to say look this is why we're slowing it down because of the importance and these are other places um so any sharing and that would be amazing thanks thank you yeah, I, I feel like I feel like there's going to be like a weird middle ground where there's going to be like loads of people that are desperate to come out and do what we used to do and be together, but then there's also going to be so many people that are still kind of standoffish and really going to need to like slowly come back into society. So, um, I think James, you were saying earlier about doing like kind of face-to-face -face events, but also having like an online thing so that people can kind of do what they're ready to do when they're comfortable to do it. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's like definitely it's been the useful rest of the year for us. Be weird. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, it, it is. It can be weird, and I think there is that excitement that everything's going to open up again. 
And I think all of us are so sick and tired of Zoom calls and having to deal with people through here that all of us are a little bit desperate for some proper human contact again and being able to network and get back to groups. Um, but you just have to, like Emma said, do it without killing people, you know, and if that means just holding off a little bit longer or having to come up with some inventive ways of uh, non-contact improvisation and spacing distance in a park, even if it looks weird with everybody in little individual boxes in the middle of a field somewhere, you know, it, you just have to try and find that way. I suppose the big thing that I'm worried about is... Um, um, I'll be careful how I word this, during lockdown, a lot of the major institutions in Leeds, and I think that's the same across the country, haven't done much engagement outside of maybe the odd broadcast. And it has allowed some free space for smaller organisations like us to get a bit more traction and to engage with people who traditionally maybe haven't gone to larger institutional spaces and the freedom to engage with them in their homes and in local public spaces. I'm concerned that when these bigger venues and bigger institutional spaces start opening, that it's suddenly going to swallow everything up and that smaller organisations like myself are really going to struggle to get heard in the same way we have during lockdown and also what that is then going to do to the access barriers because they're all of the smaller organizations and they're going to go well we can put work on at this large venue so we'll go back there like we were before and not run anything in community centers not run anything in parks or on people's streets and just going back to the situation we were pre-lockdown where we had massive issues in accessing, especially when it comes to price wars, um, as an organisation that does a lot of work for free. Yeah, that's, that's true sector wide. I mean, I think that's, that's Bob on James, that's the world's changed. And, and it's and it's got worse in many ways. But there's also, it's got better, there's there's been some improvements. So in our little part of the world, there's so many, um, well, we're a food bank now. We weren't before. It would be insane for us to go back to just making theatre. And, and you know, we run a football club now as well. Like, like all of that has, has come out of a response to community need. And I think the city's cultural landscape um, is changed and is changing. And I would say the only thing that gives me optimism, or the thing that gives me most optimism, James. There you go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna join you on your. You were, you were very diplomatic there. It was really good. I'm going to take notes. Is I think Leeds 2023 is serious. I think Carly, I have faith in her and I have faith in her team that they are looking to make the city different, more diverse, more democratic, more responsive, more connected, more rooted. And they won't get everything right. That's life. But I, but I broadly think that we will be a different city's cultural landscape in four years' time than we were 10 years ago. And, and every single thing from the councillors that I speak to or the, or, the, or, the, or the officers or whoever it is, that's, that's the direction it's driving and there'll be some speed bumps. But I, I don't know whether that, that's good news for me and you, James, or, or whether like, there'll be some losers and some winners, but I, but I feel optimistic enough to kind of go lead to the city for me for the next 10 years because I think that's a big change. I think so long as um, the smaller organisations can keep the networks going and keep supporting one another in the way that we have been, I think that's a key. And I'm glad you mentioned Lee's 2023 because I feel very much that that now has to be a much wider celebration with events happening in smaller spaces, lots of smaller events, rather than big, large events happening in large institutional spaces. Um, it would, I think it would just be a real shame for especially Leeds, and I'm sure it's the same up and down the country in major cities, to see us going back to all the work happening in inner city areas, in large venues, um, and the public suffering because of that. You know, can we still run a bunting festival, festival or a window gallery or a lamppost gallery in a post-COVID world and it still hold traction? These are really, I think, profound reflections that we do well to 
you know, to think about before um, it feels like the rest of the world charges ahead again. Um, so I'm really glad that we're focusing on this, actually, because I think the, you know, the phone ringing or the order book starting to come in, you just start finding yourself pulled along by the current of making work or making money or whatever. So I think being able to sort of hold space for these types of conversations um, in the comments, you know, you can see that we do think there's profound psychological change that's happened for people in this last year. And some, like you say, some really beautiful things, some seeds of change, some really, you know, if you saw it as a garden, you know, some amazing new shoots, some things to, to grow. Um, and so we, we've got to be, I think we're cultivators almost of more of those um, shoots that we see at a very grassroots level. And I, I mean, personally for me, a collaborative commons approach to everyday creativity and people not defining themselves as artist or creative, but human being who wants to, you know, this planet to, you know, to coexist well on this planet is our next big challenge really. So less consumerism, more sharing, more circular economy, we've really got to do things quite differently to how we've gone before. And I think, you know, Alan is a really good example of someone who takes um, that civic responsibility, like you mentioned, like public funding, um, isn't an acquisitive, acquisitive kind of approach. It's if it's, you know, if we've been funded, I'm here to support. And so each and every one of us in our little ways can probably contribute to um, a knowledge sharing and you know flow in the system rather than blockages, which is what tends to happen. Um, and that, that I suppose is the idealistic utopia almost of we, we've seen a glimpse of a future. Now, how I mean, this sounds like I'm on a soapbox, and uh, do apologise for this. I haven't been drinking. It's just something I really feel very passionate about, and I feel like the more that we can actually start to share and let our knowledge be out there in the public space the more anybody could get involved in doing something where they live um, so you know looking back at the sort of digital signage stuff the place making the things that actually exist in the built environment which people can walk past how do we make our knowledge accessible to everybody you know so if if you know how to do something on that piece of land because you've done the hard yards how could someone walk past that piece of land with a QR code on it and an invitation to put their camping chair, their deck chair, their tent, their chalk, something that invites people to feel that they can do something in that space. They don't need to have 20 years of experience. You know, so can we make legible our knowledge in a physical way so that anybody, you know, so you, you see it, people are sparked by each other doing something down their street. So, oh I didn't know you could do that and you know so that whole word of mouth and that kind of role modeling brilliant but there's still much more that we could do and I think um, you know if, if there was a journey that I would love for us all to be on is making the knowledge that we have in our heads and on websites accessible in physical places so the big dream would be how do we share that knowledge in a digital way that can then be accessed in a physical way when someone's out in their town street on their you know, bus stop. So, you know, I don't know if anybody else is up for that journey, but that's kind of why I've hoped you might have come along today, not just talk about the next step for what we're going to do, but how we, you know, fucking ace it in the future as well. Excuse my French. So uh, who's up for this? Up. Emma, I'm going to suggest that uh, um, we also have uh, Leanne in the council from SAG might also help with people answering questions and things. She's really positive and she'll guide people through processes and be really supportive. But it's a good way for people to learn kind of uh, if they're putting on events, the impact in, into the wider um, community as well. Did you say that was Leanne, Linda? Yes, Leanne. I, I'll pass you all I'll email details and things. Brilliant. So we've, we've got um, 12 minutes left. I've obviously just done my bit from the pulpit there. Um, St. Emma now steps down and says, you know, does anybody else feel like there's a practical way? I, I, lose, I lose my way a little bit when it comes to, oh, God, the admin part of this big vision. So um, I think wikis take quite a lot of people to keep them updated, accurate, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not suggesting a wiki is the solution, by the way. 
but so as I can see tonight has already surfaced people who've got stuff to share and would be happy to do that with context obviously there are examples of people who've done some awesome stuff um, and we can kind of start to connect around that but what might the next bit be to continue this forward I don't want to be the driver of it what, what, how would you see this being useful to you? Do you need to reflect a bit and get back after it? Or do you have some ideas already after tonight's um, get together? Anybody feel free to talk so I can shut up now. Um, I think it's a mix depending on who I'm speaking um, on behalf of at the time. Because um, I think probably for my own work, I'm, I'm kind of raring to go out there, but for, for like possible we've got a lot of like team and maybe funders and other people to go through and yeah it was like counting how many local authorities could we potentially be doing stuff in oh 37 ah um um and if they've all got completely different approaches then does does the whole thing just end up not happening so um yeah i think i think it would be good to have some sharing of stuff. You mentioned a wiki. Does that mean a wiki is going to happen? I mean, this is probably where things all go to pot sometimes, aren't they? Because it's like, oh no, is it the Slack channel? Is it Basecamp? Is it Facebook? Is it LinkedIn? Where's the place everybody actually likes to be to do this? Um, so I think sometimes it's just go with the thing that most people are comfortable with and let's get started to get started. And a wiki, I think, is an aspiration because we kind of know what a wiki is. We might not start there, but roughly we know it's a, a, a way of all of us being able to contribute something. I think there's some laughter going on. I don't know why though. <laughs> I'm just a bit worried that if we go for like, oh, let's do it all on Slack and if on the free plan, you can only see the last 10,000 messages, so. You know, if people have posted a load of resources at the beginning, they might get lost. Okay, so, so far, I think we've got in the chats, we've got, there's a mix of email exchanges. So, this, you know, there doesn't need to be a central conduit for this. You can all connect with each other as you see fit. You don't have to come via me or any other channel. So if you don't want your email sharing, um, let me know in direct message and I'll make sure that the post event stuff doesn't do that. But the better thing would be, Everybody who's comfortable with their emails being shared, stick them in the chat now. And then you can copy and paste the chat, I think, yourselves and keep a note of it, who you know you want to keep in contact with. Um, that might be a starter. We can arrange another meetup. If we were to meet, arrange another meetup, what sort of things have we not covered? that we might want to think about? Has it sparked anything for you tonight that you think actually I could really do with more on X, Y, or Z? In, in a way, Emma, it, it, it might be that some of this forms kind of um, organically as, as, as we know that at least this number of people in the forum, if you want, if you're like, I'm thinking of doing a market, could, does everyone mind sharing their last you know, event plan or ideas or sketches for a market, then you end up with, uh, there's, there's one in um in outdoor theatre, there's one like legendary event plan, which is 18 years old and everybody's read it. And because it's really good, <laughs> and we're just like, yes. Uh, and and uh, that, I mean, uh, yeah, by all means, I mean, the, the format by whatever is everyone, but it's but it, it, good just to meet a group of people who are like, well, yeah, it doesn't, We'll, we'll share all these documents it, it saves so much time and i think in the end you, you start to gain your own momentum don't you when you're like yeah this group of people who organize events and and people from the council not people not from the council people who are at southampton this group of people were happy to share all their bits and bobs great and then once the word gets out that you can read a really good event plan from lauren then other people are going to want to be in this gang because they're like, that's just saved me a whole heap of prep work. And now I can get right on with it properly imagining my event. And that feels like, and, and, I, and I said, that's more profound than you think. Just the sheer act of saying what we have in our brains and in our reputations, we will share with this group of people is a, is a, is a profound act because that's not how the world works. And so that's pretty good to, for, for one evening of an hour and a half. In which <laughs> none of us were entirely sure what time it started or ended 
and I swore 17 times in the first 10 minutes, this is outstanding. <laughs> I think this is a real achievement. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that's brought a nice bookend to the uh, event there. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. If you can copy and paste, do so. I'm going to not close this down immediately so you can have a grab of whatever information you see in the chat. And I think that's great because I'm going to be coming back to Alan and asking him for every single public event, method statement, risk assessment. You set yourself a whole new job there, Alan, I think. What will I offer? Um, right, so let me think, what can I offer? If any of you would like, I'm just going to say this so off the cuff, really. I mean, first of all, we've got a Love to Play Festival, which I mustn't forget, which is uh, the 10th to the 17th of April. You can upload your own events if you're doing something playful that you want people to participate in. Um, so it's love to play fun, the website, and we will share it and make sure people know about it, no matter where you are in the country. Um, I'd love to be able to do things where when we're not using the play boxes, which are the shipping containers, if it's reasonable and transport's taken care of, you know, for people to have a little go with them if they find them useful. And I don't have to do anything of staffing or running them, etc. So I appreciate that if you're in Southampton, that might actually be quite a costly uh, haulier there and back. But, you know, I, I, I really take a lot of, you know, I would just like to see people doing more good stuff and enjoying sharing assets. So I'll put that out there as a thing of a, a little tester if you feel that you might want to do something in a place with a shipping container. Because um, I've got three, well, four, in fact, so I can let one also go to do something else. So uh, if you, yeah, I think that'll do. Thank you everybody for coming along tonight. Oh, do spread the word. That's my last ask of you. It's love to play 2021 with the hashtag and have a look at the website. Claire, who's been very quiet during this session, we're gonna be doing a thing called Radio Fun Time every morning. 10 o'clock that week so we want selected guests to come and talk random fun daftness with us won't we Claire? Yes I'm going to do one um, and host it from a swing in Gledhow Valley Woods so you'll hear me swinging really? as we talk. <laughs> oh, I, I promise wait. that now so it's got to happen. Yeah. Yay. Um, that's just another good quick um, shout out for our Leeds Libraries team and Claire's one of them but they do amazing events all around the city. Natalie are you one too? <laughs> but they, they really do amazing events um, really yeah thank you. Oh, thank you Lee you're fantastic too. <laughs> and yeah I know the people who work for the council quite often have to listen to the council being sort of disparaged somewhat. So thank you for everybody who represents something that might sometimes feel a bit like, we're humans too. So all generous offers and knowledge and contributing is much appreciated. Good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for joining us. See you soon, hopefully.